Well, good morning, everyone. This is Olivia Hereford with the Bay Area Community College Consortium, and welcome to our 2020 uh, kickoff of the Bay ICT Partnership. So while we're uh, uh, people are arriving, uh, we're at, uh, the way that we've got Zoom set up is that uh, their security nowadays is either you wait, <laughs> you get admitted, or you give a passcode. So uh, as people are admitted, please um, go into the chat and give us your name, your title and affiliation. And we'll do that for a couple of minutes as uh, people get admitted into the um, Zoom room. Please, as you're coming in, welcome. Please, uh, please enter your name, title, and affiliation in the chat in the chat box, please. While we give a few minutes for people to to join us. Let me see. I'm going to come out of full screen so I can see people coming in. I like to see the chats too. Let's go to, great, very good. All right. Hey, Evan, welcome. Let's see. All right, and if, yes, if, if one of the things I'd like to ask is that if, uh, uh, when you get to the point where certainly we do, do wanna take questions when that time comes, but this is just a little bit of logistics if you all could mute yourself until and keep yourself muted until um, we get to that point where we're in discussion. Thank you. Need a minutes here. Awesome. Very good. Right. There's a few more minutes and then we'll get started. I keep doing that, sorry about that. My, my, my mouse. Okay. Ray, are we still admitting people? Yeah, uh, everybody's in, that's, that's, there's nobody that's waiting right, right now. Okay, <laughs> all right, so let's go forward. So, um, Again, thank you all for, for joining us. And I, 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 assume, well, I know in these meetings, some people are coming from other meetings. We'll probably have other people join us. But I want to welcome you all on behalf of the uh, BACC's ICT Regional Director Team. We are uh, Ray Kaut, uh, Olivia Hereford, and Richard Grodegut. And we really appreciate uh, you all being here for this kickoff. We've got some really exciting things to, to share with you. So we want to get a, a sense of um, you know, how many, uh, you know, how we're represented today. Um, and so while we're doing that, um, while I go over the agenda, uh, Ray or uh, Lauren are going to kick off a little poll here for us to get a sense of uh, how um, how we're represented here, you know, relative to a business industry. Uh, whether you're in workforce development or you're part of the Bay Area Community, Co Community College um, uh, partners. And so we'll do that while I just give you a brief uh, overview of what we hope to cover today. And I'll quit moving my mouse so that my slides quit moving around. Um, so there's the poll. So if you would uh, fill this out while we're we're, I'm going over the, um, oh, geez, stop doing that. I'm going over the agenda. What we want to cover today is, uh, first of all, start off with uh, Rich giving us an overview of what the Bay ICT partnership has uh, been doing for the last couple of years. And then I will, um, give you uh, 
a, a, a peek into some of the things that we've already got started on the, under the umbrella of the Bay ICT partnership. And then we'll have, uh, we have uh, our guest speaker, Ann Behaler here, who is PI for the National Convergence Technology Center. She's gonna tell us about this, um, the, the, the new model that we're going to use for this kind of partnership, pretty exciting. And she'll be covering that later. And then afterwards, we're gonna do a breakout and discussion. Uh, we'd like to get your thoughts and input on, um, you know, some of the priorities that we have here uh, in, the, in the Bay Area region and get your feedback on, on those priorities or, which, or an, and as well as others that you think we should be considering. And then we'll close and talk about what the roles are in the partnership and next steps. So um, shall we end the poll and see where we're at? There we go, great. So the majority of us are from the community colleges. We have community-based organizations, business. We don't have any industry shown up yet, but I know that there were several people that um, uh, signed up. I'm sure they'll be here. By, and by industry, we mean folks like um, AWS, Palo Alto Networks, uh, Cisco, those folk that uh, have been supporting us for a long time as far as informing our curriculum. So that's, what, that's the definition of what we mean by industry. So good, so we got a pretty good mix here and hopefully we'll have a couple of industry people um, join us later. Okay, so Richard, let's um, go to your overview and we can, you can bring the poll down now, let's do that. And, oh, before I do that, I'm sorry. I wanna share with you, um, you know, what is the Bay ICT um, partnership? What is our intent and purpose? And here's our statement. The intent of the, the, of, the, of the partnership is to inform and support Bay Area Community College ICT curriculum and programs, and to identify and create relevant work-based learning and job opportunities for our students and skill builders. And very obviously very important to that are these partnerships. And the people we feel in the past well, and, and have shown to be very effective in meeting this, this, this mission is to engage our business and industry leaders, to work with the uh, regional workforce development boards, as well as the business chambers and councils. Community-based organizations are very important because they are actually reach into some of the targeted areas uh, that we really want to have an impact on, particularly around the areas of equity and then the obviously we really need the support of our community college faculty administrators and we also are making plans to engage um, some of our program students and specifically alumni because they can share their experience and, and tell us what what they took away from these programs and the bay ict is convened by the bay area community college consortium okay. uh, and um Again, and also which you, as you know, is supported by the California Community College Chancellor's Office. All right, so now Richard, I think we're to your slide. There we go. Oh, great. Thank you, Olivia. And hi, everybody. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to be uh, involved in this effort once again, uh, but it's, it's not something that uh, is new today. We've been, you know, making an effort to, uh, to try to connect uh, the region together, you know, to to meet the economic requirements of the Bay Region, and to make sure we have trained people locally to take the jobs that are out there for everyone. Uh, this uh, partnership really had its origin uh, in the East Bay with the East Bay ICT partnership, and and that was part of a, a slingshot initiative. And I'm. I'm happy that some of the key uh, folks back then are here on the call today. I saw Stephen Bader's on the call. And at the time, I think he was with the Workforce Development Board with Contra Costa County. And now he's uh, uh, the executive director for the East Bay Economic Development Alliance. I hope I got your title correct, Steve. Uh, and then Barry Hathaway. I know Barry was uh, at Job Train and there was some going to be some participation from Job Train. They're a community-based organization that do, does training. and. He was at the Stride Center at the time uh, in Oakland, and then now he's with Job Train uh, on the peninsula. 
And then uh, Barbara Leslie with the Oakland Chamber of Commerce, a uh, huge supporter of that early effort. And uh, fortunately for all of us, Barb is still with the Oakland Chamber and we hope to have her and, and the Oakland Chamber continue to be involved uh, as well. And then most importantly, because we chose at the time that we really wanted uh, the Bay, East Bay ICT partnership and then the Bay ICT partnership to be industry led and community supported. And uh, I'm thrilled to see uh, our key steering committee members of back then, uh, Bjorn Pave and Dave McCandless and Tim Ahern are all on the call today. And um, I would hope maybe we could give them just a couple minutes to say a couple things, uh, Olivia, as well. But they were part of the steering committee. They embraced uh, what was then called or still the next gen uh, sector partnership model with industry at the center. Uh, that's also known as the built model, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's uh, what Anne is going to inform us on. And then my role to try to connect the 28 Bay Area community colleges. Um, and I was not terribly successful at that. It was like working with 28 individual entities, trying to get them and corral them together. And I'm so happy that today we have, I have reinforcements uh, in my role uh, with Olivia and Ray, but uh, I don't know, Bjorn, Dave, or Tim, maybe just say hi and maybe a couple words and maybe tell us why you're back here uh, to participate again. Sure, it's Dave, I'll, I'll start. So Dave Thanks, McCandless Dave. and I have uh, been involved in this from the beginning along with Tim and Bjorn and we're excited to see it come back, the Phoenix, come back from a little bit of a hiatus. I think we're all excited to see that this is an initiative that we, we, we support just because we want to give back to the industry and with the change of times and essentially the way that industry is, is morphing because of the more of the stay at home, people working remotely, creating all tremendous numbers of new opportunities for people in, in the industry that we're working in. So I'm excited to be able to continue to move it forward and see how I can help out as the initiative grows. So very excited for that thing. Thank you, Richard, for, for inviting me back. No, thank you, Dave. Thank you. I don't know if you're or Tim, want to add anything to that or? Hey, everybody. This is Tim Ahern. I'm glad to be back. Thank you for inviting me. Um, like Dave said, uh, I've been involved at the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, the times are changing. I mean, they changed dramatically over the last six months. Um, but I think, you know, Dave kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, looking at uh, how, you know, industry can make an impact and also providing opportunity across the board. And so um, I'm really excited, kind of the Phoenix rising, kind of um, rekindle things. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, Definitely all that energy out there in the marketplace uh, to make an impact. So looking forward to working with everybody here. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, not, not Bjorn Pave uh, and not too much to add to that. Those, my peers here spoke very well. So uh, just happy also to be back and part of this, invited back to it and, and provide my perspective and whatever other help I can offer to the, to the group. Yeah, thanks Bjorn. Thanks, thanks guys. That's that's uh, uh, great to have you back, and uh, hopefully we can keep you involved and make it easy for you to participate. Uh, which was something we were not able to do back then. And in, in 2018, we kind of had to uh, when we decided to expand from the East Bay to become the Bay ICT partnership. And I think we had our last meeting at Splunk uh, Corporation. I think was one of our last meetings and. Uh, I feel kind of responsible for not uh, following through with what I thought the community colleges would be able to support and bring, you know, bring some resources to keep the meetings running. And while we're back again, and uh, now the Bay ICT partnership is launching again in 2020. And, um, to, you know, to steal the phrase, I, I hope we're going to be able to build back better, you know, this organization and, and uh, uh, you know, address the employment issues in the Bay Area with local talent. And, and hopefully a lot of that talent could come from the community colleges. So great. Uh, thanks to be part of this again. Uh, glad to have someone uh, else to work with. I'm going to pass it back to Olivia. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And, and thank you, Bjorn, Dave, and, and Tim for uh, uh, sharing your enthusiasm. It's pretty exciting. I, uh, before we leave to I, this slide here, I'd just like to give a shout out to, to Steve Bader for the incredible uh, East Bay EDA Innovation Awards uh, last night. Well done, Stephen, incredible. It's definitely made me East Bay proud, <laughs> so. So uh, one of the things that uh, we've re we're really hoping for this partnership is uh, a, a 
the collaboration, uh, the opportunities for collaboration that um, were part of the goal from the, of the first uh, 1.0 version. And we're actually starting to see some of that happen under the umbrella of the partnership. Um, Ray is uh, leading a rapid reskilling project in cooperation with the Santa Cruz Workforce Development Board, which is pretty exciting. And we really hope that we can engage other regional um, workforce development boards and looking at them telling us what skills that they feel they were gonna need very quickly, particularly in this recovery from COVID-19. And uh, it's looking very promising. There is a rapid reskilling uh, projects for, um, well, Ray, would you like to just say a few quick words about, about the project in-, in Sure. Uh, um, yeah, so we have, uh, we have a couple of projects going. There's one, there's a relatively large uh, labor market demand throughout the region for, for, for first line supervisors. Uh, and so we've got a project under development uh, that should launch uh, uh, right after the first of the year for a first line supervisor. And then we also have an IT support technician. I see Terry's on, on the call. So Terry's doing that at, uh, also out of Cabrillo. Um, and we're working on a uh, Salesforce certification. Um, and all of these programs are designed to be completed in really short periods of time. Uh, the first line supervisor is 12 weeks start to finish and it's about nine units, kind of an accelerated fully online uh, program. Uh, so, so that's, that's what that program's about. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead with the cloud computing since you're leading that one as well. <laughs> okay, well I had myself muted for just a second there. <laughs> uh, so the cloud computing project is what we call an RJV. Uh, those are uh, regional joint ventures where colleges get together and collectively fund a project. Uh, so we have uh, quite a few colleges in the Bay Area that are collectively participating on a project uh, for cloud computing uh, programs. And those range from everything as simple as um, a G Suite uh, certificate, or I guess now we call it workspace uh, certifications, uh, all the way through, you know, AWS uh, architect certifications. Uh, so there's a wide range of programs under development uh, to address the need for cloud computing skills as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and one of the other projects that we're working on in collaboration with um, the International Consortium of Minority Cybersecurity Professionals is a project called OnRamp Society. Cyber careers. The ICMCP has launched an, an, an elite program uh, for the, they call the Diversity Cybersecurity Workforce Academy. And it basically is in partnership with SANS and it, 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 it provides, it's a scholarship for the training for SANS, but there is a very extensive application process and they're only accepting 500. So we're saying, well, what about, the, and, and, and they're accepting 500 applications and whittling it down to 25 that actually get the scholarship. So we're saying, what, what, how can we help those 475 students or skill builders who were interested in getting getting in getting onto the pathway to cyber careers and so we're working uh in, in collaboration with them to create uh, a program that will uh, look at all of the students at least look at all the students in our cyber programs in the bay area and create cohorts of support that, and provide them work-based learning uh opportunities and mentoring um as they progress along their pathway and to support that, we're going to need an employer engagement platform. And I think that will not only help and support our um, on-ramps project, but also this partnership as well, because then we have a means of connect, making the connections for uh, opportunities to work with faculty, to work with students, um, and um, you know, create more of those opportunities for work-based learning. Um, We've kicked off a community of practice for uh, ICT digital media faculty. And we're really looking at that community as being really key uh, in the whole process of BUILT, which Ann will be talking about next in looking at the recommendations that we're getting from uh, business and industry as far as our curriculum and what it should look like um, in, in, in 18 to 18 months to two years. Uh, in the future. 
And so uh, really excited about that because it creates an environment where we can all work together on that. So key to all of this, and I think the whole intent of today's uh, meeting is to begin to look at this new process for how we connect business and industry, workforce development, our ICT programs. And so with that, I'd like to introduce um, Ann Behala and uh, stop sharing. And Ann is gonna bring up her slides and tell us more about the built model and the roles. Take it away, Ann. Thank you, I'll just get that going here. Uh, I have it all queued up. Let's hope it'll all work well. And before I get started, we have Mark Dempsey on the line. He is the assistant director for the National Convergence Technology Center, which is the birthplace, if you will, of the business and industry leadership team model. Essentially, you can think business advisory council on steroids. And I will try to explain that as we go through. Uh, Richard, could I ask you to watch chat and have people put their questions in chat? And I'll stop every now and then, or at least we can answer questions at the end. I just have a very short presentation for you today to set context and talk about the essential elements of the built. I am not saying everything there is to know about built because that would take too long. But I just want you to know the key elements because we have been using this model to put business and industry in a co-leadership role for our programs nationally, and then also for the colleges that work with us. So without further ado, let's go down through this. The National Convergence Technology Center is a National Science Foundation Center that is based at Collin College in Frisco, Texas. Um, Ten-year reign, if you will, as the National IT Center. It means, by the way, convergence means IT and communications. When we started as a regional center in the early 2000s, it was actually the convergence of voice, data, video, and image all over the same line. And that's kind of way in the rear view mirror. Now it's convergence of all sorts of technologies over all sorts of fields. And of course, IT and cyber are underneath all of it. Uh, the Bay Area Consortium has been a major partner throughout all our work. In fact, Richard sits in as a representative for the West Coast on our leadership calls, and we really, really appreciate that. And essentially, the Bay ICT Partnership is the Bay Area Consortium's built. So you might not have known it, but you're, the industry people on the call today are all official members of the built and all of the faculty are ex officio members for the built. You'll see what that means as we go along. The CTC does work with a wide range of business leaders from all over the United States to determine the knowledge, skills and abilities that they want workforce graduates to know for the future. And I'm talking about 12 to 36 months into the future because we all take time to be able to implement new curriculum. The built information that we come up with nationally is then disseminated to colleges and universities, including 80 who share the curriculum and guidance with one another through a mesh network. That's our community of practice. And in fact, uh, they actually localize the information that we gather on a na national basis. We're looking to the Bay Area Consortium to be a regional hub for our center. When we expire, I love that word, when our grant expires in 2022, frankly, we may not quite expire then because we may have some leftover funds to have a no cost extension, but eventually we will no longer be eligible to lead the National IT Center and somebody else will take over the reins. So when we expire, we would really like to have regional hubs and we are planning and working with areas to have regional hubs to continue some of the work that we're already doing. And all the work we do is based on the built. It's the, the premise that we need employers to co-lead the work because after all, who's gonna hire our graduates? 
And if the employers are involved in leading the work, it's more likely that they're gonna find that the graduates are more employable. I think we can all agree that we want students to complete certificates and degrees. I haven't kept up with California, though I was a VP out there for a while. Um, I'll ask somebody to come off mute and tell me, are you funded, are your colleges funded based on completions now, or is it still enrollments? Or do you know? It's, it's actually both, it's a combination, but completions are becoming more and more important uh, for okay. our students to earn some kind of certificate or degree. Even a short certificate of just a couple courses could work. Well, in many parts of the country, funding for the colleges is dependent on completions. And unfortunately, they're not very uh, liberal with the interpretation of a completion for a student. Because sometimes, as you well know, students come back to our colleges to pick up a couple of courses. And that may or may not be considered considered a full degree or, or a certificate. But anyway, we want them to complete. And we want our employers to be very, very engaged because if they're very, very engaged, they're gonna to wanna to hire our students. And the built model supports both of these efforts. Okay, this is about mm, three hours of training on one slide <laughs> without the details, of course. The essential elements are these. I said it was a business advisory council on steroids. Well, I will ask each of you in your own heart of hearts, and you don't have to put it in a question or a response in the chat window or anything like that, but in your own heart of hearts, when you get advice, do you always take it? I will assert that you don't, and colleges are no different from that. If we have an advisory council that is strictly an advice council, then sometimes they spend a lot of time, the businesses spend a lot of time with us and then never really realize the return on their investment of time. In our model, the businesses must co-lead the program and I'm talking about programs that are pretty specific to a technical discipline area, not a real broad range of, of programs. But typically they meet quarterly. One meeting a year is very essential and that is focused on determining the knowledge, skills and abilities that the employers want to hire 12 to 36 months in the future. Again, so we have a little bit of time to respond. Then we also want from the employers a prediction of labor market demand. One of the saddest things I see is some colleges are way behind and that's probably not in California because I know that you're pretty forward facing with respect to IT, but some colleges have IT degrees and certificates that no longer are in demand by the industry. And that's a real problem because the students work really hard, get their degree and their certificate and can't find a job. So we wanna pair knowing what to teach with the actual demand as well. Then the other three meetings annually are for trends and to provide feedback to the business. Now, the businesses work with us and they prioritize the knowledge, skills, and abilities they want. But you know, some of those knowledge, skills, and abilities may or may not be able to be taught at our colleges, or at least not taught at all of them. For example, if you're talking about an emerging area for which hiring an adjunct instructor is very difficult, <coughs> excuse me, it may be that it's difficult to actually say, okay, we're going to address that knowledge and skill, but we don't have anybody to do it. So one of the things that can happen is you can go, the colleges can go back to the business team and say, hey, here are the knowledge, skills, and abilities you wanted that we're addressing, but here are the ones we'd love to address, but we can't. And then you explain the why. The why might be you can't find an adjunct. It might mean it needs equipment time. <clears throat> it could also mean that you need to have um, funding for cloud time, that's possible. In any event, the businesses drive the list of knowledge, skills, and abilities, and the trends, and the labor market demand. And then the faculty take the cross-reference, uh, take the KSAs from the business and cross-reference them to existing curriculum to determine gaps. And those gaps might be whole courses, or they might just be modules 
updated modules or particular courses that you already have. They then update the curriculum and then provide feedback to the business regarding the implementation, feedback to the build that is. There are a lot of moving parts to pull off this sort of an arrangement, but this is it on one slide. I'll stop right now. Richard, do you have any questions yet? No, nothing in the chat yet. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. I was you know, I, I like to stop and ask rather than just talking at you because I think it's a whole lot more interesting actually. Okay, so essential elements. Employers have told me that they are more likely to hire from programs that they co-lead or have somewhat of an ownership role in, built members or employers to provide their time. If their time is respected, meaning if I have a meeting and it's supposed to last an hour and a half and we're at an hour and a half, we end on time, we never go beyond and we follow up via email. The other thing is they wanna have feedback so that they know that their input is being considered. Along the way in my various uh, detours into corporate America, I actually participated on a couple of business advisory councils and it was kind of frustrating because at that time frame, and it was a long time ago, but in that time frame, we would go twice a year and we would give our very best advice to the college and then sometimes we would go back to the next meeting and absolutely nothing had changed. And the college pretty well acted like nothing had been advised. That erodes confidence, that's not a good thing. The ideal built makeup includes high level tech execs that have to keep those companies in business. Futurists, and I'd say the high level tech execs are sort of quasi futurists also. First line hiring managers know what they wanna hire and may have a little bit less of a futuristic view, but they know what they need to hire. And then I like to put technicians on the team as well, but not too many of them because they're the doers and they probably don't have as broad of a futuristic view. However, it's always nice to have those technicians graduates from the college programs because they can then be the bridge from the college program students over into the first line workers. HR reps can participate but usually I don't think it's a good idea if the HR rep is the only representative for a given company because the HR rep typically, not always, but typically that representative gets their information from the hiring managers. So it's kind of secondhand information. Again, faculty are ex officio members of the built. They listen, they ask questions, they cross reference what the built creates and they provide feedback to the built. Is it a, it's a really tight relationship, but when you're working with business, we wanna hear from business, not necessarily from what the way it's already been, always been done at a given college. And these are two slides that are very, very busy. And I'll give those slides to uh, Richard and Olivia easily so that you can have them. Our chairperson is a fellow by the name of Matthew Glover. He actually was hired by a company called Lavelle that is a health and wellness company to put all of their IT in the cloud, every bit of it. They have no servers. They don't have even a brick and mortar place anywhere where their IT resides. All of it is in the cloud. Well, that's not too unusual today. However, he was hired to do this five years ago and he was able to do it. It was really, really cool. Anyway, he is a big believer in the built approach and in comparing and contrasting the advisory versus the built. Advice, just as I said, can be ignored. The built is part of its makeup is that it's industry led and the KSAs are more or less required. They're required to be addressed at least. Now, a college still may not be able to do all of them and may not in their environment, may not need to do all of them, 
but it's like not, don't ignore the KSAs that the businesses say they want, at least discuss it. And then uh, the curriculum will be recognized by the built. Um, and then you can read the rest of this. It's uh, a great opportunity for the businesses to feel that their uh, contributions are really important and that they're able to give back to the community and change something. We all want to make that proverbial difference and our business members are no different from that. Then we ultimately want students to become employees. That's the name of the game. That's uh, in the community college system. That's our livelihood, especially on the career and tech ed side. And our professors want to depend to deliver relevant information. They wanna make sure that their graduates are ready for the workforce. Sometimes that's difficult because especially in the IT and cyber area, professors oftentimes are teaching not only their full load, but a full overload as well. And their opportunity for actually getting out there and seeing what the future is may be a bit limited. So this is an opportunity for the professors to hear from the leaders in the industry and know what the relevant skills are and have access to them. And the business leader has a monetary interest also. May not be their only interest, but it is very important for the on-the-job training that is needed by an entry-level employee to be limited because that costs money. That's money that is spent for their salaries when they're not necessarily able to be totally productive. So if they have led the program, chances are there will be less time before the entry-level employee can actually be really productive. Now you can read the rest of that. Some of the reasons, and by the way, those of you that know me, know that I talk about the WIFM, the what's in it for me. Each of the people on the built will have their own WIFM. Maybe they want a broader pipeline. Maybe they want to open a new business and want interns. Who knows, you know, lots of different reasons for people to be involved. But ultimately, we try to work with the business people at least every year and actually work with them either by, well, it's probably more email than phone these days, but to check in with them. How's it going? What do you think needs to be changed? And make sure we understand what equals success in their eyes. I don't think it's appropriate to think that every single one of the business people are gonna all be uniform in that response. Meetings, building and maintaining a built is high touch. It is not something that can be done totally through blasts of emails. It just doesn't work particularly well. And it also requires meeting, we say quarterly, because that has worked out very, very well for us. But think about this, the annual KSA meeting, now that we have voting for, on those KSAs via an online form, that's maybe two and a half to four hours, depending on how much time or, or how much detail you wanna go into with the KSAs. So that's one meeting a year. We like those meetings to be face-to-face, -face, if we possibly can. They will be face-to-face. -face. However, we did face-to-face -face synchronous via Zoom this year, and it worked beautifully. It has worked just fine. Then the other three meetings a year have always been held remotely with web meeting software, and actually they were held via just phone conference originally, and it worked very, very well. It was just fine, worked great. Those trend meetings are more like an hour or hour and a half. So the whole commitment that you're asking for when you ask a business person to be involved is on the order of, let's see, seven to 10 hours maybe, something like that. It's really not that bad. Of course, there are opportunities for other service with the colleges, being guest speakers, perhaps helping out in some of the WASC training. I know Richard is heavily involved in that. And by the way, that actually copies a model that came from our center as well called Working Connections. But anyway, there are other opportunities to be involved but they don't have to be involved in all of that for them to receive benefit and for 
um, actually I'm talking to most of you, for you to receive benefit and the colleges to receive benefit. Here's a slide with resources. We have some videos. We have all sorts of information to help. And hopefully there'll be some questions at this point. Any questions at all? Is this all the old hat? You already know about all of it? Is it new? What do you think? Well, Ann, you know, uh, Dave and, and Bjorn and, and Tim were kind of familiar with this model, with that next gen partnership with industry led. So they knew that they were uh, leading the meetings, uh, addressing them. And, and we had met uh, quarterly back then. And, and we were uh, had live meetings face to face each quarter, which became more yeah. and more difficult. And uh, so I think, um, you know, obviously meetings for the, the near future will have to be virtual. So, but I think they understand that process pretty well. And, uh, you know, we are looking to try to find out the trends and, and uh, you know, what employers are looking for and, uh, and hopefully to connect them with, uh, you know, our training programs that are training in the right skills. That's great. And don't forget one of the WIFMs can be that if you go hire a four-year grad, you have to pay more for them than you have to pay in general, not always, in general for our two-year grad. And if you are on the built team guiding what's in their curriculum, then they very likely could know as much or more than the four-year grad to get started. Yeah, well, certainly two-year grads that we have in the community college have had work experience. You know, they're all, almost all working while they're uh, going to school. So they know that you don't have to teach them how to work. And some of our right. you know, university grads, they haven't worked and you'll have to teach them how to work too. So yeah, there's that to consider. Okay, anything else? Uh, there's, um, there's oh, a sorry. Question. Oh, go ahead, Samantha. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Samantha from Alameda County Workforce Board. And this is more of a clarifying question, maybe Richard could answer along the lines of um, what you were saying, how we had been meeting before under the partnership and kind of had a similar model. So I was just curious, this is a model we're looking at to kind of guide the work from now on and how is it different from what was happening before? Is it adding additional structure? Or I just wanted to get clear on exactly where, where this was going. Yeah, hi, Samantha. So um, hopefully I can help with some of that, answering some of that. And, uh, you know, our, our problem before was uh, it does require some funding to you know, keep the meetings going, communicate those things. And uh, the uh, Oakland Chamber of Commerce had taken on some of that, but you know, chambers are not uh, money generating organizations. So uh, we had funding in the community college. I'm, uh, I, I was disappointed to, you know, find out that the colleges, you know, at the time in 2018, didn't see it important to fund, you know, continued operations. So we have that now. We have, uh, uh, you know, the uh, people behind it and we've got enough support uh, from the community colleges that recognize the need and hopefully now that we can make those meetings even easier for industry folks to attend by having them virtual, really using, this is the ICT sector, we're Silicon Valley, we should be able to do these meetings, you know, using the technologies. Right, guys? Sure. Anyway, yeah, hopefully I, I that guess answers your question, Samantha. Maybe, uh, Olivia, ahead. you might want to add something to that or? I know, I just wanted to point out that there, we do have a couple more questions questions in, in the chat, um, but nothing more to add to that. But we've got one from Anna. You know, I would like some help establishing the built model at my college. Who do I ask? Us, <laughs> you ask me. <laughs> uh, definitely just contact me and uh, Mark and I work on that for helping uh, to establish built models for the IT programs. And then there are other ways that I can get you help to establish built across campuses. Right now we probably have, oh, I don't know how many total colleges, but it's probably more on the order of 40 or 50 total colleges that truly want to have um, built across campus. Most, well, not all of them are across. Some of them are just IT. Some of them have gotten into it. And it's like, well, it takes a while, but we really want to do it for all of our technical programs. So we've got quite a number 
of um, colleges involved at this point. Uh, my email, I'll stick it in chat, and um, Richard also has it. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll share that. Olivia has it. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, just on the on that uh, issue, Anne, about establishing the built model at every college. Remember, there are 28 colleges, and that was my dilemma back then, being the only, you know, what at the time was deputy sector navigator for the 28 colleges. I would have to attend all of those meetings, 20. You know, I could spend all my time going to the meetings and really uh, stretching our industry folks who want to participate, too. They can't go to a meeting at each college. That's why we were looking at this regional model that, and, uh, and I could count for your programs uh, and meet the requirements for Perkins funding sure. and whatever as a meeting and probably be more useful because you'd get a broader kind of scope of input from industry who are then sharing, you know, with all the 28 colleges. And it's not just the colleges, the community-based organizations, exactly. uh, high schools, the ROP programs, they all have to have advisory committee meetings. So. And, you know, one of the things, too, that I should share uh, in my exploration of the infrastructure to support the overall partnership, we're looking at Earn and Learn. And that platform uh, allows us to um, uh, actually uh, support the advisories at the college level and keep them, you know, you know, keep your processes and your relationships um, accessible, you know, <laughs> to, to your college, but also but we want to be a regional resource that is on on top of or in collaboration with your 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 advisory. So that's going to be a really key part of our investigations on on using this earn and learn platform. That's going to be very important. So we don't want to you know we want to be a resource to all of the twenty eight colleges, not be a substitute for it. So that you know while we have access to maybe some um, workforce development partners and community community based partners and some employ employers who are willing to work with all of the colleges and so we want want to make sure that that that's available I would suggest that what we do on a national level actually gets pushed out to 80 colleges and universities some of them probably ignore us honestly but most of them are, are using it and they localize it in other words, you're, you're, I don't care if you change the name or not for your advisory council. You could take the work that comes out of the Bay ICT built and you could localize it if you need to. Um, my sense is in Silicon Valley, your needs are gonna be more homogenous than they might be in other parts of the country. But for example, in the Dallas-Fort Worth region, when we started out, we were a regional center and we had the major three uh, community college districts involved and we all worked together. As time has gone on, when our focus became national, now what we do goes down to them for them to localize at their, their local site. But yeah, I mean, it, it works. I see a lot of other questions. Do you want me to answer some of them or are we out of time? Sure, go ahead. I think we have time. We, we, we... We're a smaller group than what I thought. So let's go ahead and, and answer the questions then. Okay. So, well, in no particular, well, do you want to tell me which ones? Uh, let's see, we got Anna's and I think we have um, Terry. Um, I don't know if that's a question, but I'm All currently- right. Actually, Dean has a question about how to build those relationships. How yeah. do we get the employers to the table? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, remember the word high touch? Uh, when I started the built, and I, I apologize if some of you already know this, I was hired to grow IT enrollments in 2001. I was interviewed for the job two days after 9-11 and right before the dot-com bust. Do you remember what happened to IT enrollments in the colleges during that time? How about, choo, jump off the cliff. So... I had a choice at that time. I could either fire, I was hired as a dean, and I could either fire half of my IT staff or more. And the president really wanted me to do it. He said, you don't have the enrollment, you're gonna to have to let them go. But they had so much institutional knowledge and so much um, discipline knowledge, I didn't wanna let them go. So I went about trying to figure out how to keep them employed. 
very creative ways of stacking classes, I might add. Uh, and also we went after money from the National Science Foundation because I happened to have known that we had at that time 1,100 community and technical colleges in the US and they were almost all gonna have IT programs facing vir virtually the same thing. And that is a formula for being able to get funding from the federal government to figure out what's next. So all of that background is to say, forming that business team, the first time you form it is a super high touch activity. I reached out to, in retrospect, probably about 50 companies um, and my method for doing it, I, I had actually just moved back from Novell because I'd been uh, in charge of Novell certification program for a couple of years. Anyway, um, I, my approach was cold calling. I used the book of lists, if you know what book of lists are, where they have a list of all the companies in an area. And I called and asked for either the president or the regional director or whatever I usually didn't get that person, but I got that person's assistant. And I had my pitch down, here's what we're doing. It's for the purpose of building the future workforce for you, for the community. It's good for all, it's good for the students. And the assistant would usually tell me exactly who within that company I should talk with. And so I was a shameless name dropper, dropper. I called that person and I said, so-and-so in the president's office referred me to you and here's what we need to do. Uh, I need you to be involved in this business team to figure out the next steps in IT. And you know what, it worked. I didn't get all 50 of them or at least not initially. I ended up with 12 that came for coffee and donuts. I had to buy the donuts, so that's all they got. They didn't even get the rubber chicken. It wasn't even a meal. But they were delighted to come because it got them out of the layoff doldrums, if you will. But even if the economy is wonderful, even if everything is back to quote normal, whatever that's going to be in the future, the reality is that it's still high touch. You need to figure out why the business person would want to work with you. We have incredible value to the business community. We are in many cases, the best kept secret out there, but we have to, and I'm gonna use that nasty word, sell it. Our passion, our uh, key points, our following up. Yeah, I probably talked to four times as many people as I got to come to that first meeting, but the rest is history. We've got the regional center, we built the built out, and we are keeping on keeping on. We, we have met now together for 16 or 17 years quarterly um, and it works. So yes, it is not, not, it's not something you can do with a massive email. As a matter of fact, when we were in our offices, my method for inviting people was to send them a printed letter with a quote, wet signature on it and then put it in an envelope and hand address it and put a stamp on it. You go, why would you do that? How much mail do you get at the office or when you were in the office? How much mail did you get that was hand addressed with a stamp on it? Would you open it? Yes, that's what happened. Uh, in fact, our chairperson was recruited through that when I was expanding the opportunities for, at one point in time. You know, and I can attest to that being high touch and, and getting, you know, our partnership kicked off. I mean, I've, I, my, my strategy is I tend as many uh, professional organization meetings, exactly. things like um, the Next Gen Cyber Partnership, uh, the, I, the ISSA meetings, the ISACA meetings, uh, and just, just making people aware of, uh, you know, that we have sure. a potential solution for their talent pipeline and just keep working those those uh, relationships. And it's all about relationships. That's really what it is. People yeah. want to support us. We want to support them. Yeah. yeah, those relationships become even stronger when they're shared among everyone in the group. And, yeah. um, you know, that's, uh, and companies, you know, all, 
often want to scale too. And we do have uh, representation today from both the AWS Academy program and Palo Alto Networks Academy program. So Kim from Palo Alto and then John Lee and John Bierke from AWS Academy, they, you know, they want to scale their programs. They're willing to give to the colleges quite a bit and uh, can, can help the process. So, you know, having us work together, especially in the Bay Area where, you know, ICT is, you know, it's probably, you know, one of our top uh, employment areas. Sure. So uh, you sure. know, we want to work together. Kim, hello. Kim is actually on our built team. How are you? Sorry, I was a little late. I had another meeting. So um, hi, everyone. Yeah. Well, she can attest to its importance. She also leads our National Visiting Committee for our grant. So I, oh. I think she's pretty well entrenched in this model and can help you. I see one question I'd like to try to answer. Uh, uh, I do see someone asking about how do you get buy-in for a regional model? <sighs> Make the benefits so great by working regionally that you can't, can't say not to do it. In some states, it's difficult, but it's difficult at least to get that regional meeting to count for your advisory council meetings. In other states, it's just not a problem, but think about it. How many meetings would you want to go to, Kim, if you had, well, no, I mean, there's 1200 colleges or 12 or 1300 community and technical colleges. Wouldn't it be helpful to work with a group of 28? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've been working with Anne for, dare I say, 10 now over a decade. Um, so, um, and, you know, Richard, a very long time, many of you may be on this call as well. Um, and um, I mean, I like, it's really easy for us to partner with organizations um, and the folks that have grants as a channel, because you're, you know, have that opportunity to interact with everyone. So anything we can do to help that as well as like, you know, I think if you're going to be setting it up, usually the people you're going to reach out to may know other people that from other companies and their network that would help you identify more people to participate because they're going to be of like mind too. Yeah, we, we ask our existing built members to invite their colleagues once they understand what we're doing to invite other colleagues. That's another way to grow it. It's getting that first core group together that is the most difficult thing to do. But once you get that going, I won't say it just happens, it doesn't. You still need to pay attention to the relationships, make sure you know, that if someone moves from one company and you find out where they are, that you phone them and ask them, you know, what's the deal? What's the new thing that's going on? I mean, Eric from Splunk, for example, we worked with him when he was at NetApp and we're still working with him at Splunk. Uh, so it works really, really well. Yeah, just one last, as, as an ex-retired faculty member, I can tell you that you'll get faculty to buy into the regional model because it's, oh, yeah. it's faculty that typically have to organize the meetings, make the contacts, and doing this whilst teaching as well. It, uh, it becomes a difficult uh, uh, you know, thing for them to accomplish and do. So you know, faculty by and large would support a regional model uh, for sure. And someone asked one last question, and I, I think that's it, unless more come in. Uh, one last question about how much infrastructure is required at the college to support build. Well, it's really not more than supporting an existing advisory council if you really truly want engagement. Because you're gonna have those meetings, you're gonna have two a year anyway. I think you're at two a year in California, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to have two of them a year anyway, whatever it takes to put those two together, you just keep doing. But on top of that, it's two more meetings and they're via web meeting. So I guess you've got to have a zoom license. I think that kind of is everybody has that now, uh, or something similar zoom or WebEx or whatever. But bottom line is, it's not that much more Mark Dempsey is on the line. He does a lot of the logistics. Mark, do you want to weigh in for how much time it takes you per quarter to do this? I mean, it's pretty simple. It's really just setting up these meetings. So maybe like an hour of prep with the slides and the RSVP list, sending emails out. Then maybe an hour, an hour and a half of wrap up. We do the meeting minutes. 
and any kind of other follow up um, action items need to be done following up with people, but really it's, it's, it's not much that, that I would say. And he should know. I don't have to do logistics anymore. I used to have to do the logistics too, but not anymore. Mark does them. It's great. Now, I will call people fairly frequently, especially if maybe they were really active and then suddenly they're not. Sometimes there's a really good reason for it in their business. Sometimes it's you've kind of fallen off their radar screen. So I will do some of the personal follow-up. However, um, the logistics, they're just not that bad. And you know, one not of the things I want to, seeming not that want, to, want to stress here is that that is the intent of the Bay ICT partnership is to be, that, to be that regional advisory for you that either complements what you have or is the advisory that you use for your college. So again, those logistics and those plannings and all that high touch, that is what we want to do. And then you decide how you take advantage of being a member of this partnership uh, for your college. And that is ideal, Olivia. That is ideal. Sometimes it's a hard sell within the college, but even if you have to do both, be involved in this one and be involved in your own it will greatly improve your programs. And that is- We wanna make sure, yeah, we wanna make sure that industry is getting what they need to. I mean, they it. are key for us and we wanna make it easy for them to participate and, and valuable so that they know that we're working together and not uh, against one another as we try to uh, have our students compete for the jobs that are available, so. Sure. Yeah. yeah, if you don't mind me just chiming in real quick, I've been part of Ann's team uh, before and on some of those calls, they've been great. It's been very effortless from a industry side to be involved in. And I also agree, Richard, that that's been our goal on that side and something that I know that Dave and Tim and I have, uh, have really kind of tried to take on is to bring in as much of our peer group as possible and other industry leaders to, to those meetings and we'll make that commitment again. The whole regional approach makes a lot of sense. It really does make a lot of sense. It serves your industries in the area, your businesses in the area extremely well and actually lets them get maximum benefit from investing their time. It is terrific. And as I mentioned, the infrastructure that we're wanting to put together can, can really support both, basically so that you can basically, you could actually have your advisory supported by the infrastructure that we're looking to implement without any connectivity to our regional you know, process, if you like. But I mean, I think that would kind of be like, you know, really cutting off a lot of the uh, opportunity that you would have from, from the regional resources that we want to provide. So if you're concerned about, you know, uh, the relationships you've already developed and getting them involved in this partnership, there's a way that you can manage that as well. So. And Olivia, just to, you know, we've been talking about the advantages to employers. Um, there are some huge advantages to colleges. For example, on this call right here, we've had I see Luther on from uh, Silicon Valley. I, uh, we had Alameda Workforce Development Board. Um, so for somebody like, like Terry at Cabrillo, who's put together a fully online program of a short-term reskilling program, all of a sudden, you know, you know there's, there's access to students beyond what you would historically have thought of as your, your turf. Uh, and we've learned a lot about doing fully online instruction over the last six months. So uh, now all of a sudden uh, our horizons should be broadened from the college perspective as well and uh, start thinking about how we can serve a regional uh, labor market as well. So I, one of the, I think we wanna go on now to um, the, um, we're gonna do a breakout uh, but we, I love the questions. I think that was so much more useful. Uh, what we'd like to do though, maybe in this large, larger group is that um, our team, uh, the regional director team, 
uh, has just launched a, our first uh, iteration of our website, uh, bayict.org. And we've got uh, some featured career pathways that are based upon, you know, just input and demand and what, you know, for, for example, you know, cloud being one of them. So we wanted to um, um, get your input on uh, these featured or what we have prioritized as pathways here in the Bay Region. Uh, business applications, that's like the ones that, that um, uh, Ray was referring to earlier around Salesforce and first line a, a supervisor, as well as we're looking at something called an office collaboration uh, worker, the person that takes care of, you know, running uh, Zoom meetings and uh, Google Plus and all of the things that keep now are so important uh, as far as doing business in, in COVID. Uh, obviously, cybersecurity is one of the areas, IT, and by that I mean infrastructure, and this includes cloud, uh, and uh, software developer. So of these, we just like to get some thoughts on, um, you know, these uh, pathways, career pathways. Are you seeing others that we should consider? Or do you think any of these are not as important as, as we do? So I just wanted to, we were gonna break out, do a little networking and get your ideas on, um, on these uh, four pathways. But I think due to, due to time, uh, let's uh, get your thoughts as, as a group on those four and the chat um throw, throw them in the chat box <clears throat> if you like or or um yeah if you could, or small yeah, enough if you could put them in the chat box and i don't have to bring the screen in and i can see if anybody wants to raise their hand or make a comment or... thanks for the affirmation there vanessa <laughs> And John would call out cloud. And that's yeah, why I put infrastructure. John, we've been kind of thinking of cloud as going across everything, uh, <laughs> as opposed to something that has its own category. I mean, everything's kind of cloud now. But yeah, I get it. Any other thoughts? Would you add something here? Is, are, are, for those of you that you know are looking ahead, uh, what do you see change? I would, I would love to get some input from especially the um, active IT management on the call. <clears throat> A conversation that we have often within the Cabrillo faculty. Of course, typically faculty either have never worked in industry or have retired and it's been a while since they worked in industry. So I hear this statement. Nobody's gonna to need to know networking anymore. Why do we have those classes? Why don't we just do cloud? Nobody needs basic um, IT fundamentals. What's your opinion? Tim? Uh, Tim Carlisle, yeah. I think you wanna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think all that's still helpful by a long shot. Uh, Cloud is simply a word for somebody else's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, and I know we have some AWS folks on the call. They give you all the parts and pieces, but they don't necessarily tell you how to put it together. And that's where I think those, that networking background in combination with maybe classes uh, from AWS or one of the other cloud vendors <coughs> is really helpful. Because otherwise, that's why you have a lot of breaches, and I work in cyber. You have a lot of breaches because people don't put the parts and pieces together right. Mm -hmm. And if you say where you're from, so I am a retired IT manager, and I happen to agree that, that um, and I was a help desk manager for 18 years. So although I think a lot of things going to the cloud, obviously we know that, but unless you have an understanding, like unless you know math, basic math, how can you do higher level math, right? But I, and also there's a reality of what it is that is the, the, the practical sense of, in my opinion, of what a community college can teach. And a lot of our students in Cabrillo in Santa Cruz County, <clears throat> they're starting, you know, down here. And so if we were just to get rid of those basic classes, 
I don't know that some of our students would even be able to succeed. It's just the wrong audience, I think. So I, I don't want to get rid of those classes, but certainly they can change or be accelerated, like what, what I've been working on um, with Ray for our spring offering. It's like condense it down, um, offer it in a different way, um, do some non-credit stuff since we're being all encouraged to do non-credit, two course certificates kinds of things, but yeah. Yeah, the buzzword for us on the academic side, the course creation is to take our existing courses and cloudify them, add the clouds, yes. you know, technologies that, you know, mm -hmm. make networking work differently and, and, mm -hmm. and such. So, but we need, you know, we need help from industry to tell us how, you know, what are the things we need to cloudify our courses and, and make sure that, uh, you know, our students uh, have the skills that uh, you want in them so that you're going to hire them. So we want to make sure and hit the mark there. <clears throat> Here are some questions about uh, software developer, um, and I, I want to point out that you know under the umbrella of ICT digital media, we do have computer science, data science, etc. Uh, and those we do have to keep those in, into account because that is under our umbrella. However, a lot of those students in our in our programs they tend to be on the transfer track. Uh, and, uh, but we do also, you know, look at maybe opportunities for helping those students with work-based learning. Um, so we do include that as, as a, um, a, a, a pathway that we need, need to consider. I'm saying students need to show employees what they can do. I, you know, what I, I, I tell you, Dean, I saw that in one of the relationships that I have with a, um, a CISO as he says, you know, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a, a candidate who can, you know, not only, you know, show me, you know, tell me what they can do, but they can actually sit down, for example, and show me how they set up an environment in Kubernetes. They can show me that. So, that is exactly the kind of feedback that that we need and one of the reasons that we're we wanted to develop these relationships so that we you know, help our students are able to be able to do that yes and, uh, and i think a lot of times in training i mean they're getting a certificate but that just is a certificate that shows that you kind of have knowledge about things so really kind of encouraging the students to you know, build their own labs or do something that they can do. Because I talked to an employer who told me one thing that he would do during an interview was remove a hard drive, put the put the computer in front of the uh, job applicant and ask him what's wrong with this computer. <laughs> and that's how they would determine if the person had the skills there. So I think in the training part of it, that needs to get into, you know, they're doing hands-on work and they're doing things that they can demonstrate in their LinkedIn profiles and their resumes and those <clears throat> that will attract an employer. And that's an important part of those employer relationships that you were talking about too, Dean, is, uh, and that is always a challenge, is that, that gap between school, whichever program you go through, and the job is that, you know, zero to three years of experience. But, you know, within the program itself, you, you can do hands-on, but if we can get more employers to have a vision where they give us a chance to give our students, you know, even, even four weeks, oh, you know, 40 hours over four weeks, some opportunity to step inside virtually right now, or literally inside a company and see what IT is really about. So and I know that takes a lot off a manager because I was a manager, but that is, that, those are the kind of relationships I'm looking for, for us in Cabrillo. You know, and to the point, I see a couple of comments here about soft skills. And in my first look at the, 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 K, the KSA uh, listing that Mark shared with me, those soft skills are included too. I mean, that's part of the abilities that, that you know, we really have to make sure that somehow they're incorporated into our curriculum that helps students begin to develop those skills. So what I'm hearing here is that we really need to keep a, a, a focus on, uh, you know, the not a, all of the infrastructure that falls under under IT, um, and that um, we're looking at. I'm seeing things like um, make sure soft skills, hands on. Um, yeah, 
So anyway, I we wanted to get some feedback on on these, and I'm hearing you know that we're we're pretty much on track with the IT infrastructure and cybersecurity, uh, business applications, and we'll have to maybe take another look at uh, uh, software development and how that fits into our planning. And I I don't see a whole lot yet about that in the KSAs, but I, I tell you I have. Confess, I haven't taken a really deep dive into them yet, but they could be there. So we've only got 15 minutes left. I really appreciate um, all the feedback, uh, but I do want to make sure that we we cover the last couple of uh, things, which are primarily around next steps. So I'm going to share my screen again. All right. discuss that. So um, Richard, I think you and I were going to go, you, do you want to walk through this or do you want, want me to do it? I think I have some notes. So the first, the first thing that we're, we're going to do is um, I, I would like to make a pitch to any of you that are uh, interested in the collaborative projects that we we uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, and that is our uh, reskilling project, our cloud project, and our um, on ramps to cybersecurity. If you're any of you are interested in um, uh, knowing more about those and maybe participating either as a college our industry, our business, please, our, and especially workforce development for the um, uh, reskilling projects, please, please let us know. So I'm making that pitch right up front because those are things that are underway and we would really like to, you know, help you or, or, or get your help. Um, so before we meet again, uh, we will be looking at uh, the KSAs that the CTC has provided us. And uh, we will be working with the um, uh, regional faculty. And so I will be, for those, all of you faculty that are on the call, as well as those that have, um, have uh, registered or, or, or shown an interest in being in the partnership, you will be invited to our uh, ICT community of practice because we want that um, uh, environment to be a uh, platform for collaboration and sharing the information that we want to bring back to the built. Uh, it is a canvas based environment, though not everything will be done in canvas, but that at least will be the repository. So um, we, that will be the next step. And then our uh, next meeting, our next quarterly meeting will uh, bring us all back together. And uh, we're looking at doing that right now. We are, our next qu quarterly meeting uh, is scheduled for December 4th. That is a Friday, uh, tentatively scheduled for um, 8.30 to uh, 10.30 or 11. We really haven't solidified the hour yet, but we do have solidified the date. Uh, so if you would please put that on your calendars and we'll um, get back to you on that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, or maybe Richard, maybe I don't know, I kind of, we were going to do this together, um, about a little bit more about the roles. Um, and I, I'll just keep going since I got started. Um, so all, all of you on this call will be added as participants of the, of the, um, of the uh, partnership. Um, business and industry are the built. So if you're a business or industry member, you are the built. And the workforce development boards and the business chamber and councils are the um, advisor. And you had a term for that. I really thought that was good. But yeah, you're the advisors and the potential collaborators and um, uh, people that actually help us get this out there. Um, Community-based organizations uh, are also uh, very important, I think, particularly for some of these collaborations that we take out into the community. And of course, our faculty and, and, um, uh, the do, uh, and our community partners. That's one of the things, too. There are a lot of our community-based organizations that are actually doing traina, training. Uh, you know, Vanessa Russell from, um, 
from uh, Love Never Fails is on the call and Vanessa has a, a pre-apprenticeship program for cybersecurity. So these are the kind of community-based organization partnerships that, that we see, for example, collaborating in our on-ramps project, for example. So there's lots of roles here, but what I wanna really point out is that the business and industry leaders are the built and then all of the other partners are the contributors. Uh, they are basically informing and, and, and leveraging um, the feedback that we get from, from the build. Richard, anything to add? I was just gonna add, uh, Olivia, and um, you know, for the business partners and uh, the, you know, your, uh, your participation today hasn't, you know, absolutely committed you to continuing this. I know uh, I'm hoping that you do. And I'm hoping that we all go out and, and recruit more uh, industry members. In fact, uh, the more the better. And uh, uh, there are different levels of participation uh, too that uh, uh, the built members can can um, engage in. So uh, those of you that are on the, on the uh, supply side, the training side, um, you know, your business contacts. I mean, we've been having industry business and advisory meetings all along, we have contacts if, uh, you know, share with them this idea of having a regional place to go to and perhaps we can build the uh, employer uh, uh, base uh, in doing so. So are there any questions about um, the partnership, next step, how you can help, um, anything you'd like us to follow up on with you? Check in chat. I had to unmute myself. I have a quick question. In our regular advisories that are required at the college level that are required uh, for CTE, one of the one of the players are students. Are students also a player at the built level? Yes, in fact, that was something that um, Anne brought to, to our attention uh, when we met earlier this week. Uh, she said it's really important, and I agree, that we have uh, uh, alumni. Um, okay. So, yeah. So that, not necessarily active students, but students that have already gone through the program. Yeah. Well, well Anne, you want to speak to that? Yeah, yes, I will. I think uh, there are, I always like alumni because they have the, the whole view of how things work at the college and now they're out in the industry and they can advise to get back to where they came from. However, I also highly suggest that you have one or two students at least that you feature during your KSA analysis not a long time, maybe 10 minutes a piece, maybe seven or eight minutes a piece, where they basically answer two or three questions in front of the built and let the built ask them questions because that is the face of why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And that really helps. Now on the other students, you could have them be involved, but they need to know not to try to overtake the meeting with their questions but mm -hmm. to, for, to be listeners. Um, that, that would be my only concern there. You would need to, um, current students are, are definitely important. I'm, I'm not disagreeing at all. You just don't want them to take over the meeting. If in fact you have 20 mm -hmm. business people and 60 students that could kind of get out of hand. Yeah, yeah, no, it would be like, we don't have any students on our Cabrillo advisory, and that was one of my goals for our next advisory for this semester was, in fact, in our department meeting, which is today, I was going to ask for a couple of recommendations from the other faculty about students yes. that we might invite. That's a terrific idea. A, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Ashley, Ashley, you make a really good point. If the current students can help us understand what potential barriers are uh, and how we can support them better. Um, so that's, that, that might be another argument for having, uh, you know, at least a, a current student involved in, 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 the, in the quarterly meetings. 
Um, mm -hmm. John and yes, John uh, asked about pre-work. Um, not, you know, not at this time, but one of the things that we will do is that once we, before the built quarterly meeting, uh, we will ahead of time uh, send out the KSAs that, the first set of KSAs that the faculty have looked at um, and uh, provided some preliminary uh, feedback on you know, how close their curriculum is getting to that or where areas where, or where they have questions. So yes, we would have to provide the KSAs to the BILT uh, before the quarterly meeting. There would be some lead time for that. The other thing that we're thinking of doing, oh, not thinking, we are planning, is the second phase of our website will have a, a BILT membership uh, page where um, people that are uh, part of the member, part of the partnership will be able to go to the uh, website and get updates on where things are, any materials that you may, we may have looked at, like say for instance, it'd be great, like once we get that up, post these slides here, the recording of the meetings, et cetera. So there will be a place on our website for the partnership membership area that only would be visible or accessible by uh, members of the partnership. So we would do that. Uh, Vanessa, pre-apprenticeship map to community college map to paid apprentices map to employment. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, um, and Adele uh, Burns was on the call. Uh, she is the new regional director for apprenticeships for the Bay Area Community Colleges. And uh, we are definitely doing a, um, a really deep dive into uh, you know, how we uh, have apprenticeships as uh, available to students as internships. And I really think that what, what you're doing, Vanessa, with Love Never Fails and your pre-apprenticeship to the Registered a pre cybersecurity apprenticeship is one of those um, one of those pathways. Uh, if I could just ask Olivia, what I was just wondering if there's any examples of built being sort of it, uh, um, incorporated in that flow. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear, but it would be interesting if the you know the built program was um, built <laughs> around the utilization of a pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, community college and placement programs kind of across the continuum. I was just curious if that was part of it. You can do it that way. And I think that's a good way to do it. I'm just gonna weigh in on that. I, I, I didn't ask all these questions and I hope I'm not stepping all over your plans, Olivia, yeah. but it's certainly a really good, good way. I, I would not make that the prime focus. The prime focus is making sure that the programs are well aligned so that you, your employers know that they can hire from your programs with confidence. But certainly the a pre apprentices, apprentices, I don't know which program you're doing those through, whether it's registered or the IRAP program, but we use our built for IRAP people for sure. In fact, I think two of them have current current apprentices right this moment, two of them out of the active 2530. We have a huge number, by the way, on our bill, but not all of them can be active at a given given time. Yeah, and to be clear, Vanessa, uh, faculty, we are 100% supportive of, you know, on the job training for our students. We know that's the often the decider uh, for them and how they, whether they get employed. And, but we don't want to have 28 different, you know, college programs approaching you know, industry with re separate requests for internships and apprenticeship, they get overwhelmed with those kind of requests. So we want to have some kind of structured, formal process. And maybe this built could help, you know, establish that where, you know, that would be the go to place to find an apprentice or an intern, you know, from our programs. Okay, thank you. So I want to be conscious of everybody's time. I want to, you know, Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, we will provide these slides. We'll send them out to everybody that um, was on our list, whether they were able to attend or not. And again, if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, before we probably touch 
basis with you all again, probably in November, just kind of as an update on what's going on, no meeting, but let you know on how we're getting started. I, our faculty will be meeting. Our faculty will basically you know, have to get help us get prepared for uh, December. Um, but um, again, if you have any questions, we will be sharing uh, uh, the recording of this uh, uh, meeting as well and uh, any other questions that come up. And please uh, invite uh, other uh, business and industry leaders, other workforce developments, your partners, your faculty uh, colleagues to um, get in contact with us so that we can get them on board if they're, they're interested. So. Ray, uh, Richard, anything to add before we sign off? I just wanted to give a big thank you uh, to Ann and, and uh, Mark for coming on and then to, to Dave and Tim and I know Bjorn had to take off from coming back and trying this again with us and, and uh, you know I think we're better prepared now to uh, you know have that vision that you guys had in mind back then to, uh, to become true. So thanks uh, everybody. And, uh, I'm going to hit the stop recording button. Thank you. And thank you very, very much.